Hello everybody, thank you so much for clicking on the video. As you can see, this board is a lot smaller than my usual works, and that is because there is just too many damn characters in this TV show to cover everyone, so therefore, I'm just gonna focus on the family tree aspect of this show. Another side note, this video is not going to be at the board for the majority of the video. I've gotten tired of doing that. I'm sure you guys have been tired of seeing it. This video is going to be much more of an analysis and video essay style video, but I do have boards. I'll get into the other boards as well. I also have a timeline and a multiverse board, which I'll get to explaining later in the video. When I originally dreamt this up, I had something a lot bigger in scale, but money doesn't grow on trees and I cannot afford to buy another whiteboard. So this board also includes just the general main characters, even if they don't fit into the family tree. So Archie, we're gonna get into him. He doesn't have any ties to anyone in the family. He's just there. But I decided to put him on there because he is technically a main character in season one. And also, another side note, as this video series goes along, this board will expand. This is all the girlies in season one, okay? All the girlies that are in the family slash main characters here in the first season. And without further ado, let me get into the actual purpose of this video at the desk. So I've been absolutely consumed by Once Upon a Time, really ever since I was like 10 when I first watched it, especially in the last like four or five months, I have been diving deep into this TV show. Why not just like go in deeper and explain it further to other people? I was extremely hesitant to make this video today because I've seen so much Once Upon a Time content lately. I don't want to add to the already oversaturated market for Once Upon a Time, so I held off for a little while. Needless to say, I've spent an ungodly amount of time watching this TV show. This TV show has 156 episodes. While it's generally agreed upon that the first few seasons are really tight and grounded in reality, by like season five, it just really goes off the rails. And depending on how you feel about stories like that, that just keep going and just keep going and going and going, this might be the show for you. This is the show for me because I love it when TV shows get crazy and just have the most nonsensical bullshit in it, have random ass storylines. I mean, it can feel like such a waste of time, but it's also like, how far are they willing to go to keep this show on air? Do you know what I mean? Certain shows like Lost, like Once Upon a Time, like fucking Supernatural, all of those shows, hundreds and hundreds of episodes 15 seasons each, not really, but Once Upon a Time has arcs, so there's essentially like 14 different mini seasons in there, which is kind of insane. Today we're going to be talking about only season one, and you're probably looking at the length of the video and thinking to yourself, how much could you possibly say about one season of television? Oh my goodness, there's so much, just you wait. So the entirety of Once Upon a Time aired from October 23rd, 2011 to May 18th, 2018. Obviously, I didn't get the chance to watch the first few seasons as a kid when they were airing live, because I was literally like six or seven when it first came out. I watched the last three seasons live, I believe, five, six, and seven, which are generally considered to be the worst seasons. As I said before, season five just... And don't worry, if you haven't seen the show, I am going to be diving into every single possible element that I could think of about this show. So if you haven't seen the show and you want to go watch it before watching this video, just know you're going to have to deal with 156 episodes. Before we get going, I do just want to plug my Patreon, which is down in the description. This video will be out a day early on there. And then I'm going to do like a monthly video that's like shorter in length than these longer type videos. And that will come out a week early prior to the YouTube release. So I have one on American Horror Stories that should be coming out on YouTube after this one. So Once Upon a Time was created by Adam Horowitz and Edward Kitsis. They were writers on Lost, funnily enough. So there's a lot of similar themes between both shows. The duo wanted to create a show with hope and love at the center. They had had experience with that a little bit on Lost, which had elements of hope and destiny in it, but they wanted to create a show where that was the main focus. They had pitched the show in the mid 2000s, but decided to develop it after they were done working on Lost, which is why the show came out a whole year after Lost had ended. The synopsis of season one is pretty simple. I'm just going to read you the synopsis from Wikipedia. The series is primarily set in a fictional seaside town of Storybrooke, Maine, in which the residents are actually fairy tale characters that were transported to the real world town and robbed of their memories by Regina, 
the evil queen, who used a powerful dark curse. The residents of Storybrooke, where Regina is mayor, have lived an unchanging existence for 28 years, unaware of their own agelessness and their past lives. The town's only hope lies with a bail bonds person named Emma Swan, who is the daughter of Snow White and Prince Charming. Emma was transported from the enchanted forest to the real world via a magic wardrobe as an infant before the curse was cast. As such, she is the savior, the only person who can break the curse and restore everyone's lost memories. She is aided by her 10-year-old son, Henry Mills, with whom she was recently reunited after giving him up for adoption upon his birth, and his Once Upon a Time book of fairy tales that holds the key to breaking the curse. Henry is also the adopted son of Regina, providing a source of both conflict and common interest between the two women. Now, I'm sure by the sounds of that, it sounds extraordinarily goofy, and it is. This aired on ABC, so it's still the House of Mouse. It's not some dark, twisted retelling of fairy tales, which is an actual common misconception. When I showed my boyfriend this show, he was like, this is not at all what I had expected out of this TV show. I thought it was going to be like the grim versions of these fairy tales and not necessarily just like the Disney ones retold. And when you think about it, this show along with Alice in Wonderland 2010 really sparked the Disney live action remake fad that happened in the 2010s and is still currently happening. And, um, flopping. Once Upon a Time, for all intents and purposes, should not work in my opinion. The show reaches very high highs, but also reaches extremely low lows. It has a general middle-of-the-road production value, but when you take into consideration how many episodes there are every single season, it becomes very clear why the CGI is never quite decent. For a series that showcases witches, trolls, dragons, werewolves, the CGI is very low quality. But like I said, they have 22 episodes every single season that they have to do CGI for, so therefore the budget gets spread very thin and oftentimes has to be allocated for other purposes, such as keeping Lana Perea and Robert Carlyle on the payroll. Much like its predecessor, Lost, Once Upon a Time follows an episodic flashback format where each episode will focus on two major storylines, one set in the present day to forward the plot and one of its many, many, many storylines, and one set in a random point in time prior to the curse that focuses on one or two of its main characters. Sometimes the episodes can focus on side characters, and those generally tend to be the less captivating episodes. This format can be extraordinarily repetitive, but once you've seen it enough times, and if you're familiar with Lost and how they do the exact same thing, it becomes a little bit more bearable. Although many of the flashbacks serve not only as a tool to reveal character origins, but also make sense in the larger picture of the episode. If the writers play their cards right, you leave any given episode with a feeling of satisfaction due to how much the writers love to have flashbacks almost mirror the present day storyline. For example, in the second episode of the series titled The Thing You Love Most, the flashbacks not only reveal the story of how the evil queen was able to cast her curse, but they also reveal a possible reason. What Snow did to me, what she took from me, is eating me alive, Daddy. Her very existence mocks me. She must be punished. She poisoned an apple because she thought I was prettier than her. You have no idea of what she's capable of. So, what did you do to incur that much wrath? She blames me for ruining her life. Did you? Yes. We learn here that Snow White must have done something to the evil queen, and that the fairest of them all trope from the fairy tale that we all knew and loved from our childhood doesn't necessarily carry on over to this version of the fairy tale, and has very little to do with the evil queen's hatred for Snow White in the series. The flashback's story also mirrors the evil queen's story in the present day, Regina in our world trying her best to keep Emma away from her son, almost as if it's like a one-sided beef, uh, much like the one that Snow and Regina have in the past. The layers to this that I haven't even explained yet, uh, don't you worry, it gets very messy. With that being said, the flashbacks are very hit or miss, and usually they take up like 25 to 50% of the episode, which is a lot of time spent away from the current day storyline. I think the best flashbacks tend to be the ones that set up a clear mystery, define its rules, before in the final few scenes where all is revealed. There are some flashbacks in this show that I think really do not need to exist. For example, I personally did not need to see how dwarves are born. or how Jiminy Cricket became a cricket. <laughs> 
Yes, those are actual flashbacks that we will see in this show. Aside from those one-off episodes, a majority of the flashbacks are really well thought out, and I want to actually applaud the writers here because the fact that they were able to come up with enough stories and flashbacks to fill seven seasons of 22 episodes each is kind of insane when you think about it. Like, I wouldn't be able to do that. The better episodes tend to be self-contained, but also allow room for the writers to expand on certain elements to a character's story in later on episodes. For example, in season one, Snow and Charming without a doubt have the most flashbacks. They have a very loose storyline woven through eight to ten episodes in this season, and here are the episodes that I can think of that tie into the main Snow White retelling of this show in season one alone. We have have the pilot, episode 3 Snow Falls, episode 6 The Shepherd, episode 7 The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, episode 10 7:15 a.m., episode 13 What Happened to Frederick, episode 16 Heart of Darkness, episode 21 An Apple Red is Blood, and finally episode 22 A Land Without Magic. That's not even counting episodes that only feature Snow White and Prince Charming. There are plenty of crossovers in this show. For example, in episode 4 The Price of Gold, the episode is largely centered centered around Cinderella, however, there are certain flashbacks that reveal Snow White and Ella know each other due to their kingdoms being close by. I believe that this is a smart idea from a marketing standpoint, because even if the viewer knows that it's an episode about a D-level character such as Ella, that's not necessarily my opinion, the show just never uses her again besides like one or two episodes. Anyway, even if the viewer knows that an episode is about a recurring character, they'll still see some familiar faces such as Snow White, Prince Charming, or even Rumpelstiltskin to hold them over. I could keep talking at length about the flashback format and how I think it really does work for this kind of show. And I think it's missing from a lot of TV shows nowadays. I mean, some of them use it very loosely, but not to the extent of Once Upon a Time where you know that you're getting at least 25% flashback in any given episode. Okay, so now it's the time where I actually get to show you guys all the characters and tell you about all of them. Where do I even start? Where do I even start? Let me start with people that might be familiar to the average viewer. First, we have Snow White, famously known for her friendship with the Seven Dwarves. Miss Girl here is in love with and is married to Prince Charming. This can get very confusing because Prince Charming technically is a part of Cinderella's fairy tale and not Snow White's. And in Snow White, the prince is just called The Prince. Already we're in the confusing waters with this TV show. I already know, I know, it's confusing. Just stick with me. They have a daughter named Emma Swan. Obviously, if you know what the show's about, Emma was given up by these two so that she could become the savior. She was put in a magical wardrobe at the time of the evil queen's curse so that she could one day return on her 28th birthday and break the evil queen's curse in the Land Without Magic. She is the daughter of Snow White and Prince Charming. Got it? Got it. Snow White's stepmother is Regina, AKA the Evil Queen. As I alluded to earlier, she cast the Dark Curse, which sent everybody from the fairy tale world to our world in Storybrooke, Maine. So that's why I have a dotted blue line to Snow White from Regina, because that signifies adoption. We also find out that Emma has a kid named Henry. So Henry is the one that finds Emma and brings her to his town of Storybrook. Henry was given up for adoption by Emma because Emma was 18 when she had Henry. Henry just so happened to be adopted by the evil queen, Regina. If you're keeping track, is Snow White's stepmother. So that makes Regina not only Henry's adopted mother, but also Henry's adopted great-grandmother. If this is confusing to you, just imagine you. You are Henry, okay? Your great-grandmother, who adopted your grandmother, also adopted you, making you and your grandmother siblings. This isn't even as confusing as it's going to get. It's gonna get worse, trust me. So Regina, Snow, Charming, Emma, and Henry are like the main staple of this show in season one. We also have Rumpelstiltskin, and we will learn so much about his family tree as the season progresses. In episode two, we learn that Regina's father, his name is Henry Senior. We also have characters like Archie, which I mentioned before, who aren't really tied to the family tree, but he is still a main character here in season one, so therefore I've put him on the board. We also have Graham, who is later revealed to have been in a affair kind of relationship with Regina, which I'll touch on later. It's kind of controversial, but those are all the main slayers 
players in the first episode. In my opinion, the first three episodes act as one long pilot. All three episodes focus on the start of the Snow White aspect of this show. The pilot tells the story starting at the point of Snow White being awoken by Charming. Yes, in this show, his name is Prince Charming, even though Prince Charming is a part of Cinderella's story and not Snow White's. at their wedding, the evil queen shows up and makes a dramatic entrance and threatens to curse all the lands. You've made your vows, now I make mine. Soon, everything you love, everything all of you love, will be taken from you forever. And out of your suffering will rise my victory. I shall destroy your happiness if it is the last thing I do. In this episode, it's told from the perspective of Snow White and Prince Charming as they deal with the threat that the queen has given them. They even go as far to go and see an evil sorcerer named Rumpelstiltskin who has been detained. The only thing the deranged man wants in return for information is the name of their unborn baby. <laughs> We made a deal! I want her name! We had a deal! I need her name! Tell me, what's her name? Emma. We eventually see the curse take over later in the episode, but before it does take over, Snow White and Prince Charming send their newborn, Emma, through the magical wardrobe carved by Geppetto. At the end of the episode, Regina stands tall over the two, having finally won against them. Why did you do this? Because this is my happy ending. Episode 2's flashback showcases the evil queen's point of view of the lead up to the curse. This series does villain origin stories extremely well, however, I wouldn't call this episode an origin story. The episode, for all intents and purposes, serves as a continuation of the pilot to give us more context as to why the curse was cast. Regina has to travel to the Forbidden Fortress to retrieve her previously traded Dark Curse. After a not-so-epic duel with Maleficent, Regina comes out on top. Later in the episode, she visits Rumpelstiltskin in his cell, and he tells her what she must do. What must I do to enact this curse? You need to sacrifice a heart. I sacrifice my prized steed. A horse? Tell me what will suffice. The heart of the thing you love most. What I love most died because of Snow White. We learn here that Regina must crush the heart of the thing that she loves most in order to enact the curse, which is the heavy sacrifice that must be made. I think you're right. I can be happy. Just not here. The third episode takes us back a few years before the curse was cast. Snow White and Prince Charming meet while Snow is a bandit on the road, and Charming is a prince who's about to be married for his fiance's money. Girl. Woman. After Snow White's robbery on their carriage goes south, Snow White is found by Prince Charming, whose real name is James, although there is a caveat to that, which I'll explain later. And together, they head to the Troll Bridge to get Charming's ring back that Snow traded. They fight off trolls to get the ring back, and it's here where their love first blossoms. And, um, you can't get married without this. I know, not your style. Well, there's only one way to find out. Yeah, not me at all.
They exit each other's stories for a while, but we obviously know in the years to come they'll find each other yet again. I think the flashbacks of those three episodes really act as the beginning of this huge story that they're about to tell, so therefore I wanted to break them down just shortly at the beginning of the video rather than waiting for those episodes to come along, because I think that they do such a good job at setting up mysteries, such as what exactly happened to Emma? How does Charming know where to find Snow White in episode one? Why are Snow and Charming separated? Why is Snow White on the run? Why does the evil queen hate Snow White? All of these things are set up within the first three episodes, and answers won't be provided for us for a while, but when we eventually do get those answers, it pays off immensely. I'd also like to talk about Rumpelstiltskin, aka Mr. Gold's backstory. While Rumpelstiltskin is featured in a lot of other people's backstories, his own origin story doesn't come until episode 8 in the series. I'm choosing to reveal certain aspects of his character now because it will help y'all understand who this man is at his core. The show makes it very clear that Rumpelstiltskin at his core is a coward. They literally tell us this hundreds of times throughout the show. His flashback sees him as a normal man before the magic took over his life. We learn that he had a son named Balefire. As a poor villager with an injured leg, Rumpelstiltskin fears his son will suffer the same fate he suffered 13 years prior, becoming a soldier in a war with the ogres. So the duke enforces the draft by controlling an evil sorcerer named the Dark One using a dagger that has his magic tethered to it. This will become very important later on, so just keep that in mind. Rumpelstiltskin tries to steal this dagger and control the Dark One himself by breaking into the Duke's castle. If you were to steal the dagger, then you would control the Dark One yourself, and then no one would be able to take your son away from you. However, Rumpelstiltskin is swerved and manipulated by the Dark One to kill him. What would you have me do die. <laughs> which would set him free of his immortality that comes with the territory of Dark Oneness. Upon killing him, Rumpelstiltskin then begins to see his own name written on the dagger. Rumpelstiltskin then kills the Duke and protects his son from fighting in the wars. So we learn here that Gold's past of cowardice literally saw him take up the mantle of the most powerful dark sorcerer just so that he wouldn't lose his son. This show's definition of being a coward is so odd because I honestly would have done the same thing and I think most people probably would have done the same thing, although taking that much power is a very big responsibility. However, this episode does such a good job at making you care for Rumpelstiltskin if you previously hadn't really cared about his backstory. It's acted so well. Robert Carlyle is the best actor of the show. I will die on that hill. I'll get to the other backstories when I talk about the episodes, but I did just want to break down the first three episodes, flashbacks, and then episode eight, because those are essentially about the main characters that we have going on throughout the whole show. Snow and Charming, part of Emma's story is revealed. Regina, Gold, those are our main players here in this show, so I wanted to reveal their character traits through their first flashbacks, respectively. As for the present day plot, we meet Emma Swan, our main character. It's her 28th birthday. Another banner year. As she celebrates alone in her Boston apartment, just moments after arresting a guy during an undercover date, yeah, that's what she does. She's a bail bonds woman. And I know what you're thinking. No, this is not a cop show. Season one has some elements of cop shows, but it's a lot more serialized than those procedurals. Emma is found in her apartment by Henry, her son. Yes, Emma has a son named Henry, whom she gave up 10 years ago. Well, if that's not a self-fulfilling prophecy, I don't know what is. This show, by the way, just does generational trauma so well. Henry forces his birth mother to drive him back to his hometown. Where's home? Storybrook, Maine. Storybrook. Hours outside of her town of Boston. So she drives him home and on the way, he springs this fairy tale obsession on her. He believes that every living person in his hometown of Storybrook, Maine is a character in his special one of a kind book of fairy tales with one caveat. They don't have any memory of their past lives. Maybe he's just trying to help you. He's the one who needs help because it doesn't know. 
that he's a fairy tale character. None of them do. They don't remember who they are. Actually, two caveats. They haven't aged in 28 years. And Emma's like, Hmm, I'm 28 years old. As they arrive in Storybrooke, we meet Archie. Archie is Henry's therapist, and he's one of the first characters we meet in the present day that are allegedly from the fairy tale world. Archie sends Emma to Mayor Regina Mills' house, and what can I say about this performance? She is just so good. As both the evil queen and present day Regina, Lana Perea, she's number two, babes. She's number two right behind gold, and it's very close. We also meet Graham in this scene, who is consoling Regina after Henry had been missing all day. Graham is the sheriff of Storybrooke, and in his past life, he was actually the huntsman from Snow White. From here, Emma shares a drink with an almost threatening Regina. Am I strict? I suppose. But I do it for his own good. I want Henry to excel in life. I don't think that makes me evil, do you? Emma leaves Henry at Regina's before getting in her car and leaving Storybrooke. However, on her way out, she gets into a car crash and runs into the Storybrooke sign after seeing a random wolf in the road. The next morning, Emma wakes up in the town jail and flirts around with Jeremy Dornan before Regina arrives and proclaims Henry has ran off again. Using Emma's expertise in finding people, they check Henry's computer and learned that he used his teacher's credit card. And who is his teacher, you may ask? Why, Snow White, of course. Well, actually, Mary Margaret. As I said earlier, a melancholic teacher of the fourth grade, she's much like Snow in the flashback, just more subdued, no doubt because of the curse. Her and Emma begin a very solid friendship here. Regina has been very hostile towards Emma thus far. So Mary Margaret is like the one person that Emma thinks that she can actually trust in this town as soon as she meets her. Almost like they already know each other. Sorry to bother you. <laughs> It's okay, I fear this is partially my fault. See, Henry hasn't had the easiest life. No, she's kind of a hard ass. No, oh, it's more than her. He's like any adopted child. He wrestles with that most basic question they all inevitably face. Why would anyone give me away? I am so sorry. I didn't mean in any way to judge you. It's okay. Oh yeah, we also get this scene. What he needs is a dose of reality. This is a waste of time. Emma finds Henry at his playground castle, which is very much a reference to Snow White and Prince Charming's castle in the past. The two have a great conversation, which I always go back to as a really solid foundation that's laid here in the pilot for Emma's character. While the two have very similar upbringings, Emma was never actually adopted, whereas Henry was. The two almost have a trauma off in this scene. Henry, can you see I'm not crazy? I have to get you back to your mom. You don't know what it's like with her. My life sucks. Oh, you want to know what sucking is? Being left abandoned on the side of a freeway. My parents didn't even bother to drop me off at a hospital. I ended up in the foster system and I had a family until I was three, but then they had their own kids and they sent me back. Your mom is trying her best, and I know sometimes you think she doesn't love you, but at least she wants you. It's a very cathartic scene for both of them to air out their individual traumas. I myself am not a huge fan of Henry. I think sometimes he can be a little bit stale, but in this scene, he's very good for a child actor, and I think part of it is having Jennifer Morrison as a scene partner. So Emma takes Henry back to Regina's, and it's here where they have an absolute mother off. Regina threatens Emma. Yesterday was my birthday, and when I blew out the candle on this cupcake I bought myself, I actually made a wish. I didn't have to be alone on my birthday. I hope there's no misunderstanding here. I'm sorry? Don't mistake all this as an invitation back into his life. Oh. Miss Swan, you made a decision 10 years ago. I've changed every diaper, soothed every fever, endured every tantrum. You may have given birth to him, but he is my son. I was- No, you don't get to speak. You don't get to do anything. Do you know what a closed adoption is? You have no legal right to Henry, and you're going to be held to that. I will destroy you if it is the last thing I do. Later that night, Emma decides to stay in Storybrooke, getting a room at the inn run by Granny, obviously from the Red Riding Hood fairy tale. It's here where we meet Mr. Gold, a pawnbroker that owns most of the town. He's collecting rent from Granny when Emma arrives, and he's seemingly in a bit of a trance when Emma tells him her name. What a lovely name. Thanks. 
While it won't be revealed until later, at this very moment, Mr. Gold's past life memories as Rumpelstiltskin have returned to him upon hearing Emma's name, which is actually a component Rumpelstiltskin built into the curse. And with that, at the end of the pilot episode, time starts to move again and the clock tower in Storybrooke begins to tick, signifying a change has arrived. With episode two, we begin to see a trend that I think the show does really well. I alluded to it earlier, but I'm a big fan of the flashbacks that serve a purpose for the characters and the character dynamics, as well as expanding the character's backstory. This episode does that so well. The episode is basically like a mother off between Regina and Emma. Emma is given Henry's file by Dr. Archie Hopper, only for him to report back to Regina, revealing to us that he gave it up to set Emma up as a thief. <sighs> That's what you're looking for? Later in the episode, Emma responds to Regina by cutting down her apple tree. <laughs> Apples. You're out of your mind. No, you are if you think a shoddy frame job's enough to scare me off. You're gonna have to do better than that. Your move. It's here where Emma is thrown out of Granny's because of her past as a felon, which the mayor's office had called to remind Granny about. I'm afraid we have a no felons rule. It, it turns out it's a city ordinance. Let me guess, the mayor's office just called to remind you. Emma finally tries to be civil with Regina by having a one-on-one -on -one where she agrees to leave if she feels Henry will be okay. I have no intention of taking him from anyone. Well, then what are you doing here? I know I'm not a mother. I think that's pretty self-evident. But I did have him, and I can't help it. He got in my head, and I want to make sure he's okay. While she's there, she calls his obsession with fairy tales, quote, crazy. The poor kid can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality, and it's only getting worse. It's crazy. You think I'm crazy? It's revealed here that Regina knew Henry would be at her office at a certain hour, and that Emma would slip up around Henry. You knew he would be here. Did I know that my son comes to my office every Thursday at precisely 5 p.m. so I can take him for dinner before his therapy session? Of course I did. I'm his mother. Your move. So yeah, this episode feels very much like the two are just trading victories over each other, and it's very, very interesting to watch. It's very soap opera-y, but it's my kind of episode where these two are just going at it, going for each other's throats. Like, I'm sure in real life you would not say this to any real person. I will destroy you if it is the last thing I do. At the end of the episode, we see Mr. Gold taunting Regina. Regina quietly accuses him of being, um, awake from the curse, but Gold plays it off. It's revealed here that Mr. Gold is the one that procured Henry for her. In Regina's twisted mind, he specifically sought out a child whose mother could be a threat to her on purpose, knowing one day that she'd show up. I'm not entirely sure if Regina knows at this point that Emma is the savior, but it makes for a really interesting tension between these two mega villainous characters. I also wanted to mention a really interesting aspect to this scene that I think the show does really well. When Regina is barking at Gold, Gold tells her to leave him alone, and he says, please. That is a direct callback to the flashback in this episode, where we learn Regina had to go to Rumpelstiltskin herself about how to cast the curse, and he had her add in a component to the curse where if he ever asked her nicely for something, she'd always have to obey that wish. Should I ever come to you for any reason? You must heed my every request. You must do whatever I say, so long as I say. Please. It's a fun little callback that kind of goes unnoticed the first time you watch it. If the first episode establishes Snow and Charming's story and relationship as the curse hits, the third episode is much more of a character study on both Snow White and Prince Charming, how they met, how they fell in love, and finally how they ended up going their separate ways. In episode three, we are introduced to Princess Abigail, who has a red line to David. I know you can't really see, but underneath this character, is right where the red line is. Red lines mean they have some kind of arranged marriage or they have some kind of love that isn't true, which is opposite to the pink line, which essentially just means they are truly in love, such as Snow White and Prince Charming. In the present day storyline, Henry tries to get Emma to ask Mary Margaret for help in waking up the John Doe at the hospital. He believes that by reading Snow White and Prince Charming's story, John Doe will awaken. When Mary Margaret tries this, John Doe actually flinches and then ultimately gets up and walks out of the hospital later that night. This 
this scene actually ends up mirroring the first scene of the show where Prince Charming awakens Snow White. So here we have Emma, Mary Margaret, and Graham searching the woods for John Doe. They figure out that he went to the Toll Bridge, which is obviously a reference to the Troll Bridge in the past storyline. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! I need an ambulance! Regina arrives to find out that Emma and the others have found John Doe. She reveals to the gang that his name is David Nolan, and he has a mysterious wife named Catherine. Hmm, interesting. All is well at the end of the episode, however, Mary Margaret's hope has been completely diminished. The shot of Regina at the end, watching as Mary looks on at someone whom she felt a connection with, is heartbreaking. We also see Emma and Mary Margaret begin to room together, since Emma has officially decided to stay in Storybrooke. So at this point, Once Upon a Time has basically hit it out of the park with the first three episodes. It's a very good start to the season, and one that I have absolutely no trouble re-watching over and over and over again. The episodes introduce us to our main sleighs without giving us too much information. It furthers the plot for the present day, and raises questions about how each character became the way that they are after the curse hit. And now it's time to talk about two episodes that I think on a fundamental level do not work as well as the first three. Episodes 4 and 5 both serve as Cinderella stories, with the fourth episode being a literal episode about the character of Cinderella, and then the fifth episode being about how Jiminy Cricket became a cricket by accidentally killing the parents of a younger Geppetto, which is just a sentence I'm gonna have to give you guys context for later. But first, let's take it away to Cinderella, or as I like to call her, Flopella. For a TV show about a bunch of different fairy tales, the first couple retellings are all centered on Snow White. We see characters like Pinocchio, Geppetto, Red Riding Hood, and Rumpelstiltskin, which don't really belong to the most popular fairy tales. You'd think they would start with the most popular stories, however, until this point, they really hadn't besides Snow White. In episode 4, titled The Price of Gold, we see the story of Cinderella. In my opinion, it falls very flat. If they wanted to keep this fairy tale as close to the original Disney film as possible, I think it kind of fails. I mean, it obviously must have been very difficult because the Disney film is set in a much different time period period, and the princesses at the time were very much still in their damsel in distress era. However, that argument can also be made for Snow White. In fact, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves came out almost two decades before Cinderella, and this show still manages to make Snow White a very strong character. In the episode's flashbacks, we see Cinderella just after her stepfamily leave for the ball. She wishes on a star, and her fairy godmother arrives to grant her wishes, just like in the 1950 film. However, a twist has been added to this retelling. Rumpel Stiltskin shows up and kills the fairy godmother before making Ella sign a contract that's totally not important and will definitely not get her in trouble later. Yes, thank you. Anyway, we flash forward to Ella's wedding with Prince Thomas. This can be kind of confusing at first because obviously Cinderella's prince in the original Cinderella film was called Prince Charming, and in the Snow White film, her prince is just called The Prince, so they kind of just like flipped the roles here for some reason when they could have just stuck to the material and it would have been so much less confusing. At the ball, Ella is warned by Rumpelstiltskin about a specific clause in the contract that she signed stating that if she were to ever get pregnant, the baby would immediately be given to Rumpelstiltskin. Ella and Thomas work together with neighboring royals Snow and Charming to trick Rumpelstiltskin Stiltskin and capture him in the prison that we saw him in during the pilot, so we know that this episode takes place prior to when Snow and Charming went to go visit Rumpelstiltskin in his cell. Just sign the contract, please. Are you sure you're happy with this new arrangement? And so it shall be.
Meanwhile, in the present day, Ella's counterpart, Ashley, is very pregnant, like she's about to burst. And even under the curse, she still owes Mr. Gold the child. Ella attempts to run away before Gold gets Emma to find her. Emma eventually realizes that the property she's retrieving for Gold is the baby, and Emma ends up going back on the deal with him. Meanwhile, we meet Sean, who is the prince in the flashback, stands up to his controlling rich father in order to help the poor damsel Ashley take care of the newborn. The episode is another Cinderella story of sorts, as it sees Jiminy Cricket as a human being forced to scam with his parents, who are thieves themselves. After going to Rumpelstiltskin for help, Jiminy accidentally poisons the couple his parents are scamming, as he believed he was just giving them the fake cure his parents made up for this illness. He had intended to use the poison on his parents, but they ended up switching the bottles. Later that night, Jiminy wishes on a star, and down comes the Blue Fairy. But it is not possible. I cannot bring back the boy's parents. I hear your wish. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the present day, Storybrooke is dealing with a cave-in of sorts, and Henry the little rascal that he is, drags Dr. Hopper down there to look for evidence that the curse is real. At the end of the episode, Emma and Regina work together to rescue Hopper and Henry, and Hopper ends up successfully standing up to Regina, who had been forcing him to work for her, as previously mentioned in, like, episode two. Because someday, Madam Mayor, you may find yourself in a custody battle. And you know how the court determines who is a fit parent? They consult an expert, particularly one who has treated the child. I suggest that you think about that and you allow me to do my work and let me do it the way my conscience tells me to. Both of these episodes follow a very similar format and have extremely similar themes. The episodes are very similar, both following an oppressed person who doesn't come from a really great family life, finally standing up to whoever had been controlling them. We see Ella use Emma to help stand up to Mr. Gold in episode 4, and Hopper ends up standing up to Regina in episode 5. I think it's okay that they're a little similar. My only real issue with these episodes is that they both don't really serve a wider purpose to the main character characters' stories. They're both side character stories. I feel like there's not enough about the main story here. It just kind of feels like we're wasting a little bit of time. Technically, Hopper is a main character as noted before. It's just that his one and only flashback story was just done the episode prior with the Cinderella episode, but I digress. I think episodes like this are just okay, and some of the time they can be really good, but if it's about a character that's not necessarily the most important, it can feel like a waste of time when you have so many other characters that you could have potentially flushed out. Episode 6, titled The Shepherd, features a flashback about Prince Charming prior to meeting Snow White. So this can be kind of confusing, but we learn that he had a twin that was traded off to King George at their birth, and when the actual Prince James dies, David must take his place and defeat the dragon that is threatening King Midas's land. We see here that he is forced by King George to take Princess Abigail's hand in marriage. Princess Abigail's father is King Midas, who promises to make their kingdom rich again. Okay, so as you can see, episode six introduces us to a whole new lot of characters over here. It's told to us that his name is James, but that's not technically true. His name is really David, much like his present-day counterpart's name is David. He actually has a twin brother named James. These twins were separated at birth because their mother, whose name is Ruth, gave one of them away to King George, which is why James becomes a prince and later dies, which is why Charming has to assume the position of James because King Midas, who is Abigail's father, demands a knight valiant enough to defeat a dragon. James was supposed to assume that position. However, he ended up dying and Charming had to come in and take his place. It's really not that hard when you watch it, but this just looks... As for the present day storyline, David struggles to remember his life with Catherine. You know, probably because it wasn't real. David's memory is eventually jogged by a windmill in Mr. Gold's shop. Suddenly, all his memories flood back into him, and his feelings for Mary Margaret become a little complicated. He turns Mary Margaret down after originally leading her on. I remember. Catherine? 
Everything. So I think it's time I talk about Sheriff Graham. In episode 7, The Heart is the Lonely Hunter, set years before Snow White meets Prince Charming, Snow and Regina mourn the loss of Snow's father, King Leopold. Only Regina isn't actually in mourning. As it's revealed, she killed the king herself. Her magic mirror, whom I've yet to mention somehow, helps her find a huntsman to finish the job so that she will be next in line to rule the kingdom. The kingdom's still loyal to her. They would turn on me. Perhaps one of your knights. I need someone adept at murder. In that case, you need a huntsman. This huntsman that the magic mirror finds fails to complete his mission to take Snow White's heart because he is a little bit of a softy. Sign this when you need help. What? It's a whistle. It will bring you aid. You'll be led to safety. Now go. Regina then figures out that the heart he procured for her was an animal's heart. The huntsman lets Snow White go, much like in the fairy tale version of this story. She then takes it upon herself to take the huntsman's heart out with her bare hands. And this is something that we'll see many, many times in the show. We learn here that by taking a heart, you can enchant it and then control the person it belongs to, much like the dark one in the dagger. Meanwhile, in the present day, Graham kisses Emma because he has lost all feeling in his fake relationship with Regina. He talks to Henry later in the episode and actually believes his theory about the fairy tales. Graham convinces Emma to help search for his heart, which leads them down in Regina's vault. And Regina and Emma get into a heated argument. I don't know what I ever did to you, Miss Swan, to deserve this. To have you keep coming after everything I hold dear. I told you it's not her. Henry came and found me. Graham kissed me. Both were miserable. Maybe Madam Mayor. You need to take a good hard look in the mirror and ask yourself why that is. And later, a fist fight. Gina! Later that night, Graham kisses Emma again, and this time he regains his memories, thus proving the fairy tales are real. Only moments later, Regina is seen in her vault, crushing Graham's heart, effectively killing him off, because if Regina can't have him, no one can. This episode comes off as very strong, however. I'm not a huge fan of the fact that they literally wrote that Regina had been R-wording Graham for over 30 years. I just feel as though that went a little too far, and it's arguably kind of forgotten because it's so early on in the show. This episode also marks the end of the autumn run of episodes with episodes 8 to 22 coming out in early spring. From what I can find, the only major reason for Jeremy Dornan's exit from the show, besides the fact that he wanted to focus on other endeavors, is that the writers wanted to add some form of stakes to the show that confirmed at least partially that this whole fairy tale thing was real. It wasn't all in Henry's head. While I understand why they did this, I find the whole Emma and Graham brief relationship angle was very rushed, and this storyline should have been saved for a little bit later in the season, assuming that they knew that they were going to get picked up at this point. As mentioned before, the first seven episodes were meant to be the end of season one. ABC ordered an additional 15 episodes on November 4th, 2011. While not uncommon for a new series on network television, it's so odd to look back at this format of storytelling nowadays, and there's hardly any full series orders anymore. It's all like six or eight episodes episode miniseries that end up getting cancelled once they flop. Anyway, the show had successfully been picked up for a full series. They were averaging like 9 to 11 million US viewers every week, which looking back is nuts. Considering nowadays TV shows on network TV can hardly crack 5 million live viewers, times have definitely changed. Along with the semi-awkward ending to the episode came hope for the future because the series had been renewed. Many fans expressed excitement online for this news and and uh, the show began to get like a bit of a cult following. It was getting very big on Tumblr around 2011, 2012. Right after season one is when like it was just like popping off. So moving on to episode 8, this episode features the first flashback centered on Rumpelstiltskin about him turning into the Dark One, which I mentioned before. <sighs> the 
present day storyline features an election for town sheriff between Emma and Sidney Glass. The flashback is relevant to the present day because Emma comes to Gold and asks him to assist her in getting elected, seeing as he seems to have a lot of power. Gold starts a fire in the mayor's office, unbeknownst to Emma, which allows her to be the hero and save Regina. This puts Emma at a decided advantage during the election. However, Emma eventually figures out that Gold started the fire himself, and during a debate, she exposes Mr. Gold and believes that she has just forfeited the whole election. Fire was a setup. Mr. Gold agreed to support me in this race, but I didn't know that that meant he was going to set a fire. The worst part of all of this is I let you all think it was real. I can't win that way. This action alone gets everybody to vote for her as they're more afraid of Mr. Gold than they are of Regina. Here to card me, officer? Well, not at all. In fact, uh, I think I'll join you. Here? I don't know. I think they're setting up a back room for the victory party. Oh, well, you'll have to tell me what that's like. Congratulations, Sheriff Swan. And the fact that Emma has just stood up to Mr. Gold shows people want to support her. It's revealed at the end of the episode that Mr. Gold had even planned to have Emma expose him using reverse psychology. The flashback's theme of coming into power having a cost or a price to pay directly influences the present day storyline where Emma comes into power herself but ultimately feels guilty about it because of how she got there. This episode is great in my opinion and is one of the best in season one and it's very overlooked. I really love the correlation between Emma and and Mr. Gold's stories. So episode nine titled True North kind of flops a little bit. It's not really that bad, it's just kind of forgettable and it kind of goes along the same lines as the Cinderella episode and the Jiminy Cricket episode, although I really do love Regina in the flashbacks. In the past, we see Hansel and Gretel are separated from their father. The evil queen finds them and offers to help them find their father if the children venture into the blind witch's house to retrieve a powerful weapon for her. The children are captured by the witch and make an escape by burning her alive. After returning, the children refused to stay with Regina. You were left alone in the woods. You deserve better than a father who would abandon you. But he's all we have. Perhaps he doesn't have to be. You and your brother have impressed me. I've decided to invite the two of you to live with me. Here. No. We want our father back. We'll see about that. It's sort of hinted here that Regina just wants a child to love and take care of, which is obviously what we see in the present day with Henry. Regina then sends the children to the infinite forest where they will remain alone, separated from their father until the curse is broken. This episode also features a scene where Regina looks into her mirror and sees Snow White sulking with the seven dwarves. And don't you worry, we will see what that's about in a couple episodes. As for the present day, Emma reunites the two children, Ava and Nicholas, with their father, whom they under the curse, have never met. The episode is generally considered one of the weakest of the season, along with episodes 13 and 14, which I'll obviously get to. So during this segment, I'm going to talk about Mary Margaret and David's relationship as it pertains to the past and the present day. I've basically tried to save anything like post episode three for this portion of the video because their storyline is dragged for this whole season. And episode 10 is like the first episode that we get that's like focused on both of them since episode six. And I kind of touched on that episode while I was explaining it. In my opinion, this storyline, while it can be very good and well thought out, it can also be a very slow burn. In the present day of episode three, Snow Falls, we see the origin of their very cursed relationship. Clearly by the end of the episode, we can see Mary Margaret has begun to get feelings for David as something inside her feels connected to him. David himself has just woken up from a supposed three year coma, recently reunited with his forgotten wife, Catherine, and then met a new woman named Mary Margaret, whom he also has feelings for, all in the span of a day. In episode five, that still small voice, Snow helps David rehabilitate as a volunteer for the hospital by going on a walk with him. The two are clearly like already in love with each other. It's here where Catherine shows up and unintentionally splits them up. And Mary Margaret definitely feels guilty for flirting with the man. She can't seem to get him out of her head. In episode six, The Shepherd, we see David finally return home for his welcome home party. And the only person that 
that David did end up wanting to see after being released from the hospital, Mary Margaret, is nowhere to be found. And Regina is very forceful with Catherine about how she should feel about David not regaining his feelings for her. David walks over to Mary Margaret's house, suspecting he was the reason she resigned from the hospital. Mary Margaret reminds him that he is still a married man, but David ends up confessing his feelings for Mary Margaret, saying that he has absolutely no attraction to Catherine. Oh, come on. Don't tell me it's one-sided. You're married, it should be no-sided. Should be, doesn't matter. Later that night, David essentially confesses that he doesn't have feelings for Catherine, right to her face. Later on in the episode, Regina tells Mary Margaret that she and David do not belong together. You don't belong together. He's not yours, he's taken. Find somebody else. I haven't done anything. So he just up and left his wife on a whim. He did what? It's here where Regina reveals to Mary Margaret that David has left Catherine. And later in the episode, David confronts Mary Margaret and tells her that if she meets him at the Troll Bridge, he will know how she feels. It's here where we get the scene where David walks into Mr. Gold's shop for directions, as he doesn't remember how to get to the toll bridge, when his memory is jogged by the windmill in Mr. Gold's shop, as I alluded to earlier. This belonged to me. Really? I remember. His feelings for Mary Margaret and Catherine have now become complicated. He ends up going to Mary Margaret at the toll bridge and leading her on. I remember. Catherine? In episode 7, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, Emma sees that the night before, Mary Margaret had had a rebound with Dr. Whale, the same doctor that she was on a date with in episode 3, Snow Falls. In episode 8, Desperate Souls, David and Mary Margaret are on opposite sides of the sheriff's election, with David in support of Sidney Glass, seeing as Regina and Catherine are friends, and obviously Mary Margaret is in support of Emma. By episode 10, titled 7.15am, the two are flirting with each other, by both showing up at Granny's at the exact same time, only to exchange looks. In this episode, Emma ends up catching Mary Margaret in the act, essentially, and Mary Margaret has to confess that she still has feelings for the man. This is making a volcano, so you're a stalker. No, not really. Maybe a little bit. I and mean, it's not like I'm following him. Later in the episode, at the store, Mary Margaret runs into Catherine, who is shopping for pregnancy tests. I wasn't looking. Clearly. Um, this must be... Good luck. Regina then gives her a very threatening look, as it's a very awkward situation, and Regina obviously seems to know that the two are flirting around. I also just want to point out, why is Regina shopping with Catherine? Like, I know they're supposed to be friends, but Regina is just seen everywhere with Catherine during this season. It's so funny. This episode's flashback sees Snow White weeks or months after meeting David, unable to shake the feelings that she has for him. She is told by her friend Red that David is marrying Princess Abigail. Snow White goes to Rumpelstiltskin, obviously years before he's trapped in a cell in her kingdom, and he fashions a potion to help her forget about the prince. Meanwhile, David himself does not want to get married to Princess Abigail. He writes a letter to Snow White via a carrier pigeon, and Snow actually ends up receiving this letter and tries to go proclaim her love for David by breaking into George's castle. However, she is found by George and locked away. While locked up, she meets Grumpy. Tried it all. Steel gets stronger as we grow weaker. A mysterious dwarf that we've never heard of before called Stealthy breaks them out, but Stealthy gets killed immediately by King George's men. After George finds Snow White, he tells her that she needs to go and break Charming's heart or else George will kill Charming and not her as punishment. Because you are gonna walk down that hallway, Snow White. You're gonna sneak in and tell him you received his letter. You're gonna tell him why you're here because you don't love him. Snow realizes that this is her only choice to stop Charming from getting killed, so she goes to Charming and confesses that she does not feel the same way about him, which breaks his heart. Now that I know that you love me too. I don't. Prince Charming looks for Snow White in the woods. He runs into Red and asks her where Snow White is. Meanwhile, Snow is living with the seven dwarves, and Grumpy barges into her room with great news. Prince Charming and Princess Abigail's wedding has been called off. However, in the most fucked up twisted scene, we learn that Snow White ended up taking the forgetting potion and has absolutely no clue who Grumpy is talking about. Who? These two just can't catch a break. Back in Storybrooke, Mary Margaret and David help a pigeon, yes, a 
pigeon find its way back to its flock. A huge storm hits Storybrooke, and the two find shelter in a cabin in the woods, finally feeling like they are alone enough to do this. But Mary Margaret ends up pulling away because she remembers that Catherine is potentially pregnant. However, David was never told about this. David, I know. You know what? About Catherine. What about Catherine? That she thinks she's pregnant. What? So when Mary Margaret accuses him of cheating on his pregnant wife, David is confused as fuck because he doesn't even know that Catherine is potentially pregnant. So yeah, they agree to stop seeing each other every single morning at Granny's. However, David then reveals to Mary Margaret that Catherine isn't pregnant. She's not pregnant. It's here where the two passionately kiss as somehow this makes it okay. And we see in the background that Regina is just staring at these two with the meanest mug on her face. She is about to be on the warpath in the next few episodes, you best bet. It's so tragic for them to constantly get separated by Regina or George or Catherine. It makes for a very compelling storyline. And also, by the way, David and Mary Margaret's chemistry isn't even contained to the show. As Jennifer Goodwin and Josh Dallas, the actors that betray the roles, are currently married with two children and they met on the set of this show. If that's not the most poetic and beautiful thing in the world, I don't know what is. The 11th episode is a bit of a low point in my opinion in terms of action. Throughout the episode there's a lot of tension and it looks as if they're trying to build to something very big. After a small little twist the episode kind of fizzles out a little bit and all the tension kind of goes away. Starting with the flashback we see a genie's lamp being found by King Leopold. Awaken the genie of Agrabah. And to the surprise of the audience, the genie that actually pops out is none other than the magic mirror, aka Sydney in the present day. I've seen a lot of people complain about this aspect of the show. Throughout the show, we find out that a lot of characters have double identities. Even in the next episode, we're gonna see one. Yeah, just for now, know that a lot of the characters are kind of combined. The king uses one of his wishes to set the genie free and gives his last wish to the genie. The genie then says that he will never use the wish because he knows that the price that comes along with the wish usually outweighs the positives. The genie then agrees to live with the king and his castle as the genie is very lonely. It's here where we see the genie meet Regina. <laughs> I noticed such a lovely tree. Yes, it's from my childhood garden. Over the weeks that follow, Leopold reads Regina's diary, which has an entry about a mysterious lover. The genie is asked by the king to find this man. The genie obviously knows that he himself is the man that Regina is writing about, which puts him at an awkward position. Regina convinces the genie to use the Agrabah Viper to poison the king so that they may run away together. He poisons the king and the king dies, which tells us that this episode is direct directly before episode 7's flashback, Regina basically gets away with the murder and tries to place blame on the genie who's from Agrabah. The genie, feeling betrayed by Regina, uses his last wish to try and make Regina love him. You fooled me. You never loved me. Loved you? I've wanted the king killed and you killed him. You are no longer of any use to me. There is still one wish remaining. I wish to be with you forever, to look upon your face always, to never leave your side. However, all this does is trap him in her mirror. In episode 11, we see that this isn't really a reveal, but I decided to keep his identity a mystery so that it could create suspense. But here we learn that Snow White's father's name is King Leopold. He obviously was married to Regina. It's not that hard to figure out. Regina had to have married him in order to adopt Snow. So he has a blue line to Snow because that is her biological dad. And he has a red line to Regina because they were in an arranged marriage which I'll explain later. Meanwhile, in the present day, Henry's favorite playground is destroyed by a bulldozer. We also see David and Mary Margaret having a sneaky little picnic in the woods, which is curious. In this episode, Emma teams up with Sydney, who apparently was ghosted by Regina. They work together to try and expose a possible secret purchase Regina made using city funds. Emma and Sydney follow Regina out into the woods, only to 
realize someone has been tampering with their brakes. They eventually find out that Gold and Regina had just had a business transaction out in the woods. Gold sold some of his land to Regina. This perplexes Emma and Sydney as they have absolutely no idea what Regina could be using the land for. So they head to her office late at night when she's not around. Emma feels as though she can just barge in without a warrant. This sets the alarm off, which alerts Regina, who shows up minutes later. Oh. What are you doing? Some kids broke in. I heard the alarm, so I'm checking it out because... I'm sure. Sydney and Emma play it off as some kids breaking in. The next day, Sydney shows Emma some photographs, which literally prove that he was spying for Regina on Emma and Henry. At the city council meeting, Sydney brings up the files that Emma and him found at the office. They accuse Regina of stealing city funds to build a mansion out in the woods. You claim that you act in the best interest of all of us, but that isn't the truth, is it? The truth is you are a thug that doesn't care about anyone or anything but yourself. You are right, Miss Swan. I am building a house. A playhouse. The accusations are true. Regina then reveals that it's not a mansion, it is in fact a new playground for Henry to play in. So after the city council meeting, Emma has kind of learned to swallow her pride here a little bit. Not only did she break the law to try and prove the fact that Regina was lying about some mysterious city funds, her exposing Regina just did not end up going over so well because Regina ended up revealing that there was not even anything shady going on. Emma's feeling a little bit down in the dumps and Gold shows up and offers his assistance in the future. It's here where we see Regina basically forbidding Emma from ever seeing Henry again after accusing her of stealing the city money. You're gonna stay away from me. And more importantly, from Henry. And at the end of the episode, we see that Sydney is still working for Regina. So reviews for this episode were understandably very mixed. The flashbacks incorporating the genie slash mirror are just okay and does little to convince us why Sydney is still helping Regina in the end. So episode 12, mm-hmm, it's one of my favorite episodes of this entire show. I'm gonna explain the episode in the order of which the scenes happen and not necessarily by storyline. The episode opens with Sir Maurice and his family under threat of ogres. That's when everyone's favorite clown arrives to help. Rumpelstiltskin says he will keep the ogres at bay on one condition. My prize is her. The young lady is engaged. Me. I wasn't asking if she was engaged. I'm not looking for love. I'm looking for a caretaker. For my rather large estate. I will go with him. I forbid it. Oh. I will go with you forever. Deal. Belle. Belle. You cannot do this. So yes, Princess Belle is officially in this show, and not only is she in the show, but she's Australian. In the present day, Gold is repoing Mo French's car. Mo French is obviously Sir Maurice from the past. At Granny's, Ashley, do you remember Ashley? She arrives and Ruby suggests that all the girls go out for a girls' night. Emma turns them down and gets a call about a break-in. Back in the past storyline, Rumpelstiltskin assigns his new maid, Belle, a bunch of different chores. While making Rumpelstiltskin Stiltskin tea, Belle accidentally drops one of Rumpelstiltskin's teacups. Got it. Oh, and you will skin the children I hunt for the pelts. <laughs> that one was a quip. Oh, Emma, I'm so sorry, but uh, it's, it's a chipped. Oh, it's just a cow. Back in the present day, we see Gold insists Emma leave because he knows who broke into his house. We see that Gold is very, very upset about a specific object that was taken. Back in the past, we see Belle and Rumpelstiltskin begin to get a little bit more close. Belle is trying to open the drapes. <laughs> Thank you. We see that Sir Gaston arrives, attempting to rescue Belle. However, Rumpelstiltskin turns him into a rose. Belle tells Rumpelstiltskin about her aspirations to see the world. I'll tell you what. Go to town and fetch me some straw. When you return, 
I'll share my tale. You trust me to come back? Oh, no. I expect I'll never see you again. And Rumpelstiltskin basically lets her leave to go get straw at a nearby village. So after season one, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, so if you want to remain unspoiled, just skip to this timestamp. There's about 10 different flashbacks with these two characters, and a lot of the time they are not in Rumpelstiltskin's castle. But here in this episode, Belle and Rumpelstiltskin are talking as if her leaving is a taboo subject, something very rare. I just wanted to point that out because it's sort of implied that this episode only takes place over a couple of days, but with the amount of flashbacks the two have together, I have come to the conclusion that they were in each other's company for a few months to even a year. Back in the present day, David is buying two separate Valentine's Day cards, which just, that can't end up badly, could it? The same woman. Well, they're both so us. Well, you're fortunate you're someone that loves you. Oh, we also get a scene where Gold kidnaps Mo. Back in the past, Belle is on the road and is stopped by none other than Regina. Did my carriage splash you? Uh, oh no, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I'm tired of riding. Let me stretch my legs and walk with you first, Belle. Regina suggests to Belle that, tr that true love's kiss could break the spell that turned Rumple into the Dark One. He'd be a man again? An ordinary man. True love's kiss will break any curse. Which kind of breaks the entire canon of the show because they had already established that the only way to get out of this is by having someone else kill you and having them take the power for themselves. Also, the Dark One has probably kissed people before, I assume, so why would this time be any different? But anyway, Belle now has a reason to return to Rumpelstiltskin. This scene where Belle returns to the castle and Rumpelstiltskin is so giddy to see her again is honestly very cute. I will admit defeat here. Belle then asks Rumpelstiltskin why his son is gone, and Rumpelstiltskin remains confused as to why she came back. Tell me about your son. I lost him. There's nothing more to tell, really. And since then, you've loved no one, and no one has loved you. Why did you come back? I wasn't going to. Something changed my mind. Kiss me again, it, it's working. It's here where we see Rumpelstiltskin rejecting this kiss. He begins talking to his mirror, having figured out that Regina is behind all of this. This is you being the hero and killing the beast. This true love- Shut the hell up! Why won't you believe me? Because no one, no one can ever, ever love me! This scene is juxtaposed with the present day where Gold vigorously assaults Mo French and screams about how Belle's disappearance was all his fault. Oh, it wasn't my fault! What are you talking about, my fault? You shut her up. You had her move. You shut her. She's gone. She's gone forever. She's not coming back. It's... Yeah. Mo, having absolutely no memory of the past, still believes this is about the van. In my opinion, this is one of the best scenes in the entire show. Like, Robert Carlyle is such a good actor. He is too good for this show, I fear. I could gush about this for hours, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on. At the Valentine's Day Girls' Night Out, Flop Sean proposes to Flop Ashley. And I'm so sorry, I do not really care about this at all. Not after the scene that happened just prior. We then see a much better scene where David approaches Mary Margaret and gives her a Valentine's Day card, which was meant for Catherine. So... Sorry, I meant, I meant this one. Emma, who has just stopped Mr. Gold from killing Mo, tries to get to the bottom of what Mr. Gold is talking about. When Mr. Gold refuses to tell Emma who the woman he's talking about is, Emma arrests him. Back in the past, Rumpelstiltskin lets Belle go and tells her that he doesn't care about her. Go? I don't want you anymore, dear. You were freeing yourself. You could have had happiness if you just believed that someone could want you. You're a coward, Rumpelstiltskin. And no matter how thick you make your skin, that doesn't change. I'm not a coward, dearie. My power means more to me than you. 
Now you've made your choice. And you're going to regret it. All you have is an empty heart and a chip to come. It's here that Belle leaves Rumpelstiltskin and the two will not end up crossing paths again in the fairy tale world. In the present day, Regina allows Emma to see Henry so that she can talk to Gold. She reveals she's the one that hired Mo, all because she wanted to break Mr. Gold so that he could admit his real name. What's your name? It's Mr. Gold. Your real name. Every moment I've spent on this house, that's been my name. But what about moments spent elsewhere? If you want me to return, what's yours? Tell me your name. Rumpelstiltskin. This scene is so good. You guys don't even understand. I just want to let this scene keep going without cutting. Please go watch this show. It's just too good. Oh yeah, in the past, Regina tells Rumpelstiltskin she's dealing with a certain mermaid, which will become important at some point in the show. Oh yeah, she also mentions to Rumpel that Belle is dead. Well... You can rest assured I had nothing to do with that tragedy. After a while, she threw herself off the tower. She died. Back in the present day, it's revealed by Regina that Belle is in a mental ward, revealing her to have been locked away by Regina in the past. And that's where the episode ends. So there's this underlying element of Stockholm Syndrome that kind of stains a rather good episode. And I don't want to gloss over this aspect, as that might make this bigger issue in movies and TV shows almost worse. I feel like because they're clearly doing Beauty and the Beast here, they sort of have a pass because they're sticking to the source material. Even though Rumpelstiltskin is being equated to the Beast, it's almost worse than in the 1991 Disney film. The Beast doesn't look human, and therefore his actions of kidnapping Belle are sorta, and I use this word very lightly, justified. Because he doesn't look human, at least at first, before we realized he was cursed, Rumpelstiltskin, however, is human. And while not cursed like the Beast, he once was a good person, and Belle, much like her 1991 counterpart, tries to see that in him. Rumpelstiltskin is different from the Beast because he chose to become a monster, and I think that's the only critique I have of this story, as opposed to the 1991 film. Stockholm Syndrome aside, when you ignore that aspect of the film and subsequent TV show, and focus on the why of it all. I think the explanation here is a little bit poor, and therefore Belle's decision to stay with Rumpelstiltskin is less justifiable than in the film. An update on the tree, we have Rumpelstiltskin has a girlfriend named Belle. While they're technically not together in the present day, they were together in some sense in the past. It's implied here that they have true love, so therefore I've given them a pink line. In episode 13, What Happened to Frederick, the flashback takes place mere days after episode 10's flashback. Before David can find Snow White as he promised to do so to Red, David is found by Abigail and must venture to a lake to retrieve some of its waters, which have restorative properties, in order to save Abigail's true love, Frederick. So not unlike Charming, Abigail is also very against this arranged marriage. The lake is guarded by a shape-shifting Siren. Siren takes the appearance of Snow White and tries to seduce David, however he is able to overpower his lust and kill the Siren. David is then able to reunite Abigail with Frederick, and the two-part ways not very relevant to the storyline in the present day, other than the fact that this episode feels much more Catherine-focused than David-focused. In the present day, Mary flat out tells David that he has to tell Catherine about them. Then it's time to tell Catherine. But David fails to tell Catherine, and he continues to lie, and Regina is the one to eventually tell Catherine about the cheating. Ow. So Mary is confronted by Catherine in the school, and she seems to be more upset at Mary Margaret than her own man, which is kind of fucked up if you think about it. And David, he's kind of being a flop around this time, because he has multiple opportunities to tell Catherine about it, and he still chooses not to. At the end of the episode, we learn that Catherine has decided to go to law school in Boston, the way David looks at Mary Margaret, that's what I want for me. What are you talking about? I'm sticking to my plan and moving to Boston. Alone. If I stay here, I'll never be happy. I wrote him a letter. Him and Mary Margaret. Uh, I'm sorry, you did what? I can't see him, not now. 
It's just too painful. Mm. I'm gonna miss you, Regina. But you know what, Catherine? This just may be what you need. Regina's plan has basically just backfired on her. I mean, Mary is now being openly catcalled and hated on, but with Catherine leaving, this will allow Mary, Margaret, and David to get together anyway. If, that is, Mary can forgive David for lying about telling the truth to Catherine, something that Regina cannot let happen. At the end of the episode, Catherine's car is revealed to have been in an accident, and her body is missing. Ooh, that's tea right there. So Regina is basically staging all this to frame someone for the disappearance of Catherine. That's a storyline right there. So episodes 14 and 15 are two of my least favorite episodes in the season. It's not that the episodes on their own are that bad. It's just that the storylines that are featured in the episodes don't really impact the whole wider story. Episode 14 is a grumpy centered episode and tells the story of how he fell in love with a fairy named Nova right after being hatched. We see Grumpy before his name was Grumpy. Technically, he was named Dreamy beforehand. He is convinced by none other than Belle in a tavern to go after the woman that he loves. It's not in his head, it's in his heart. You're in love. He realizes that fairies aren't meant to stray from their jobs, and neither are dwarves. This episode's message as a whole is awful, because it's kind of giving capitalist propaganda. Grumpy eventually learns to forget about having a life outside of work, which, like I said, is a terrible message. And it's not like they're playing it for sympathy. They are more or less saying that this is the right thing to do. But why should I be surprised when ABC's parent company is Disney? The present day storyline features Mary Margaret and Leroy trying to get volunteers for some Miner's Day candle sale in order to to raise funds for the nuns to pay their rent. I think I forgot to mention, but the nuns are essentially the fairies from the past. It's a little bit of a flop episode. There's some funny scenes, I guess you could say, between Mary Margaret and Leroy, but nothing really important happens until the very end of the episode. Emma is investigating the circumstances regarding Catherine's disappearance and takes David into custody when Regina and Sydney, who is still working with her, doctor some fake phone call records to place David as the killer. Also, this episode supposedly takes place on my Miner's Day, and if you look it up, Miner's Day takes place on December 6th every single year. But two episodes ago, they were just on Valentine's Day, which is in February. Make it make sense. In episode 15, the flashback storyline focuses on Snow White while on the run, and Red right after meeting one another. The two try to find out who the big bad wolf is that's been terrorizing Red's village. Granny eventually reveals to Snow that it is indeed Red in the least subtle twist ever. So Red eats her love interest, and Snow decides to stick by her side and the two flee the village together as now Red is like a fugitive. Meanwhile, Ruby quits her job at Granny's and begins working with Emma at the sheriff's station. Emma basically forces an unconfident Ruby to find David, who's still in the woods, by the way. Please back up and we can eat it in the car. I need to do a little wilderness search and I need your help. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm just gonna screw it up. I mean, I'll screw it up with Flair, but no, you won't. Come on. After they find him and take him back to the hospital, Emma has Ruby look for evidence at the toll bridge. Ruby ends up finding a box. Yeah, needless to say, Ruby decides to return to the diner at her old job and make amends with Granny. At the end of the episode, Mary, Margaret, and David remain very anxious about the whole Catherine disappearance situation. This is when Emma walks in, and they both prepare for terrible news, rightfully so. There is a human heart inside it. There's more. <laughs> what? There were fingerprints inside the lid of the box. David, the fingerprints weren't yours. They were Mary Margaret's. And the pieces have come together. This was Regina's plan all along. She just pretended to frame David, reverse it, and then pin it on Mary Margaret. Mary, Margaret, and David have been on such a journey. Oh my goodness. We left off with these two in episode 10, 7, 15 a.m. The two had collectively agreed to stop seeing each other despite their feelings. Mary, Margaret is very concerned about how Catherine will feel when she eventually finds out about it. David finds out Catherine isn't pregnant, which somehow in their minds makes it okay for them to be together, finally sharing a kiss. She's not pregnant.
I mean, it definitely uncomplicates it more, but it's still wrong because David is still choosing to be with Catherine. Regina sits idly by, watching as they kiss, while forming a plan to take them down. A plan that will become known in the 13th episode, What Happened to Frederick? A plan that sees Regina kidnapping and or killing Catherine to drive a wedge between the two lovebirds. By episode 14, titled Dreamy, this plan seems unpromising as Mary comforts David in his search for what happened. Regina doctors evidence that proves David lied about speaking to Catherine over the phone the day she disappeared. Emma and Mary Margaret remain in support of David, however, and Emma finds nothing wrong with David's statement, so he is let go. But when a new piece of evidence is revealed in episode 15, titled Red Handed, the blame shifts to Mary Margaret. By episode 16, by episode 16, titled Heart of Darkness, we will see what comes of Mary Margaret getting uh, accused of such vile behaviors. In the flashback storyline, however, the duo are not doing any better than they are in the present day. The episode takes place right after episode 13, What Happened to Frederick's past storyline. We see since Snow took the potion given to her by Rumpelstiltskin, she's grown to be a bit violent and disgruntled person. <sighs> what do you want? Dinner time. She started living with the seven dwarves and treating them horribly. In response to the dwarves banding together and forcing her to go get a cure from Rumpelstiltskin, she heads to him yet again, instead looking for a magical bow to allow her to kill the evil queen, now having her heart set on revenge. Charming attempts to stop Snow from killing Regina, however, Snow ties him up and keeps him from stopping her. Jiminy unties Charming, which allows him to take the arrow instead of Regina. In the end, Snow chooses to kiss him and her memories are returned. However, just as the two are about to celebrate, King George has found them. Charming is arrested. After this, Snow returns to the cottage and apologizes to the seven dwarves. Meanwhile, Rumpelstiltskin uses some hair from the both of their heads to bottle some magic for a quote, rainy day. In the present day, Emma and Regina interrogate Mary Margaret, who Emma believes is most certainly being framed. Later on, Emma looks for signs of a break-in and finds nothing. However, she does find a hunting knife in Mary Margaret's heater. Emma grows conflicted, almost questioning if Mary Margaret has what it takes to do such awful things. Henry proves his mother has something to do with the framing of Mary Margaret when he shows Emma a set of keys he found in his mom's office that allegedly can open any door in town, according to Henry. They test the keys in Mary Margaret and Emma's apartment. Please run. heads to Dr. Hopper for a hypnosis. During this session, David's past life memories are returned to him briefly through visions of him telling Snow White not to kill Regina. David is still very groggy after this. The details are very jumbled, and he begins to believe it might have been Mary Margaret to kill Catherine if he has these memories. David confronts Mary Margaret in her cell and asks her if she did it. You think you remember me wanting to kill Catherine? Can you explain why I have that memory? David, are you asking me if I had something to do with Catherine's murder? Sheriff found a heart in our spot. It was in your jewelry box. The weapon was found in your apartment. I have these, these memories. When your phone records came back, when I found you wandering in the woods, when everyone thought you killed Catherine, I stood by you. I never once doubted you. Do you actually think I am capable of that kind of evil? Get out. Mary Margaret's own love interest is refusing to believe her after she believed him when he himself was accused of the same crime. And at the end of the episode, Mary Margaret finds a mysterious skeleton key in her cell under her bed, and she uses it to escape from jail. I can smell a setup from a mile away.
The flashback features a new character named Jefferson, who's confronted by the evil queen who needs his, quote, talents to world travel to another realm in order to retrieve an object a powerful queen has stolen from her. The realm being Wonderland, and the object being her father. Who was shrunken by a mushroom, presumably. The hat's magical portal powers, however, only allow the same number of people per travel. So Regina ends up leaving Jefferson and taking her father with her. Jefferson tries to replicate his magical hat to return to his realm in order to see his daughter yet again. All right, so episode 17 brings us to the multiverse. Technically, we've already been aware of it, seeing as all the characters went from fairy tale land to a land without magic, but we get our first hint at there being more than two. With the introduction of Jefferson, we learn that Jefferson's hat can take any number of people to any world that they want, and we see that when they step through the hat, it's like a room of doors that takes them to whatever world they want to. The only world that we see other than these two in season one is none other than Wonderland. The show gets very, very messy with its world building. Somewhere around season five, you will probably just lose track of what's going on on this board when I add more worlds to it. And don't worry, things will get much messier from here on out. Starting in season two, the purpose of this board will become a lot more clear. As the seasons go on, we'll see many, many more places in the past and present. Get ready for those. In the present day, Emma searches for Mary Margaret, who has run off. Emma is in the woods when she is found by Jefferson. For whatever reason, Jefferson has remained awake all of these years, and he actually believes in the whole past life theory that Henry has going on. He kidnapped Emma in order to use her supposed savior magic to finish his hat, so he may kidnap Paige and take her away from the curse. I want you to get it to work. Oh. You want me to get what to work? After failing to recreate Jefferson's hat, Emma fights her way out of captivity and breaks Mary Margaret out of the house as well. Jefferson, however, is nowhere to be seen. Mary Margaret decides to stop running and return to jail. But it's your choice. Emma, everyone thinks I killed Catherine. Mary Margaret, you have to believe me. You have to trust me. Why is it so important to you? What happens to me? Because when Regina framed me and you bailed me out, I asked you why and you said you trusted me. And then when I wanted to leave Storybrooke because I thought it was best for Henry, you told me I needed to stay because that was best for him. Nobody's ever been there for me except for you. But I can't lose that. I cannot lose my family. Together, they beat Regina back to the jail cell. I just wanted to point out Regina's look of confusion, obviously confirming that she was behind the key appearing in Mary Margaret's cell. In episode two, The Thing You Love Most, we learn that there is a potential reason as to why Regina hates and wants to even kill Snow White. But I can't keep living like this. What Snow did to me, what she took from me, it's eating me alive, Daddy. In episode three, Snow Falls, after David and Snow White meet, David asks Snow what she could have done to deserve being wanted by Regina. Snow replies with, She blames me for ruining her life. The seventh episode, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, gives us some insight to Regina and Snow's relationship prior to Snow being cast out by Regina. Regina seemingly was a comforting stepmother during Snow's mourning of her father. Come to realize, however, over the course of the episode, that Regina had begun to resent Snow and Leopold's relationship, and we will eventually learn that Regina used the naivety of the genie to poison Leopold. In episode 11, Regina's plan to use a huntsman back in episode 7 failed because he was a softie at heart, and couldn't kill another human. For literal years, Snow lives a life of banditry in the woods, and it isn't until that fateful day where she meets Charming where her luck had suddenly begun to turn. By the 10th episode, 7.15 a.m., however, she let go of David and lied about her feelings for him after being threatened by King George. In episode 16, Heart of Darkness, after taking a memory potion gifted to her by Rumpelstiltskin, Snow White had lost all hope of finding love ever again, 
and set her mind on killing Regina for casting her out and stealing her kingdom. Regina had been living lavishly and often terrorized villages. She even got Hansel and Gretel to steal an important object from a blind witch, which almost got them eaten alive. The important object that they stole? Well, I'll reveal that later. All for revenge on Snow White. But why? What did Snow White do to piss Regina off so much? We get our answer here in episode 18, titled The Stable Boy. Back in the past, we meet a character named Cora. Cora is Regina's mother. We learn that Cora often uses magic to force Regina into a submissive role. Regina has a crush on the stable boy named Daniel and wishes to run off with him. Cora clearly would not approve of this and is insistent on Regina marrying a man of high rank. All of a sudden, a young girl is riding on a horse gone rogue. Regina sees this and hops on her horse to chase after her. It's okay, dude. You're safe. But I'll never ride again. Nonsense. The only way to overcome fear is to face it, to get back on that horse as soon as possible. Regina. I'm Snow. Snow White. This girl is Snow White. After saving Snow White's life, Regina is thanked by Snow White's father, who just happens to be the king. King Leopold then proposes to Regina right on the spot. Will you marry me, Regina? Yes. Yes. In the days that follow, Snow White catches Regina and Daniel kissing out in the stables. Ooh. Regina makes Snow White promise to keep it a secret, otherwise Cora would have a field day with Regina. Later on, Snow White is manipulated by Cora to reveal what has been going on with Regina, who's been acting odd lately, according to Cora. After learning about all this, Cora confronts Regina as she's about to leave with Daniel. Regina tries to explain the situation to Cora. She doesn't love the king, she loves Daniel, and she wants to spend her life with Daniel. But Cora just cannot let this happen because she's so fixated on Regina being the queen, like the highest ranking woman in the kingdom. Instead of letting them go, Cora takes and and then crushes Daniel's heart right in front of Regina. This forces a bitter and resentful Regina to live a loveless marriage and adopt the girl who got her true love killed for 10 years until she finally loses it and has the king killed in episode 11. And that's why Regina hates Snow White so much. She couldn't keep a very important secret. The last scene of the flashback sees Regina in her wedding dress as she hears out Snow's confession. Mother would let you marry him once she knew how happy it'd make you. Once she knew how much you love him. Did... Did you tell her about me and Daniel? Yes. But I told you very specifically not to. <sighs> Regina holds back her emotion and lies to Snow White, telling her that true love isn't real. Daniel ran off. Daniel has run away. What I had with Daniel wasn't real. Obviously, Regina knew then and there that eventually she would have her revenge. I stated back in episode 2 that that episode was Regina focused, but it wasn't necessarily an origin story. This episode, however, is an origin story. This episode finally gives the audience a reason why this blood feud is happening. Regina told Snow White in confidence about her secret lover, and Snow ended up ratting them out, which got Daniel killed. On its own, this is such a great episode, and in season two, they'll actually expand a lot more this time period in Regina's life, and those episodes are also very, very good. All right, so finally, the last two characters who will be revealed this season have been revealed. There is another question mark here, and I'll save that for season two because that is when it is revealed. But we learn here that Regina's biological mother is Cora. Obviously, that means that her husband is Henry, and that's why they have a red line because it was an arranged marriage. We also learn here that Regina's true love is named Daniel, and that's why they have a pink line. However, Daniel obviously is dead, but I'm not gonna keep track of who is alive and dead because that would just be too complicated here. That is the season one board, if you would like to take a good look at it. I'm sure you guys will have questions, comments, and concerns about why your favorite character isn't on here. Red, Granny, the dwarves. There's a lot of characters I left off, I know, but they are not technically related, nor are they main characters, so therefore I haven't put them on the board. Sue me. We learn that one week before Catherine's disappearance, 
Regina confronts Gold and asks for his help in dealing with her Mary Margaret problem. And it's here where we learn that Gold was in on it the entire time and helped Regina stage the disappearance of Catherine. So Gold is now playing both sides. Back in the present day, Regina wakes Mary Margaret up. Regina offers her the chance to confess, but Mary Margaret stands by her innocence. Regina tells her that confession or not, she is going to be leaving Storybrooke. Because confession or not, you're leaving Storybrooke. And you like that. Why? Why do you take such pleasure in this? What did I ever do to you to make you hate me so much? Mary Margaret then talks to the DA, Albert Spencer, who happens to be King George's counterpart in the present day. Albert straight up accuses Mary Margaret during the questioning, eventually goading Mary Margaret into admitting that she wanted Catherine gone. After she made you a pariah in your own town? Yes, of course I wanted her gone. She was the only thing keeping us apart, so yeah, I wanted her gone. Is that what you want to hear? Meanwhile, Emma returns to the crime scene where the box was found and finds a piece of a shovel. She illegally searches Regina's garage, suspecting her to be behind all of it, and finds a shovel with a missing piece. Emma now has no doubt in her mind Regina is guilty. After directly confronting Regina with a warrant, who seems to have nothing to hide, Emma sees the shovel has been replaced. So Regina is always seemingly one step ahead of Emma. At the end of the episode, Emma hears Ruby outside of Granny's screaming her head off, and Emma's like, what the fuck is going on? So they go outside and... I think it's about time I talk about the August-sized elephant in the room. As you may have noticed by now, I have skipped over any mention, any storyline, any episode focused on August. August is a bit of a weird character in my opinion. He shows up in episode 9 for the first time on his motorcycle. Not even Henry knows who he is. This baffles Henry because according to him, no one can enter Storybrooke unless they are from the land of fairy tales. I thought you said strangers don't come to Storybrooke. They don't. Throughout the next few episodes, Regina and Emma grow confused and paranoid about this August being around their son. In episode 11, titled Fruit of the Poisonous Tree, after Henry's book goes missing, Henry sits at Granny's and tries to write the stories down so he doesn't forget. Later on, we get the reveal that this man is the one who stole Henry's book. Hmm curious. In the 13th episode titled What Happened to Frederick, Emma and August meet and he later takes her down to an old well for a drink of water. Emma thinks this guy is just some nut, but hours later, Emma starts brushing leaves off her car and she finds a red metal box that holds Henry's book. At first glance, the audience may be a little bit confused at this whole storyline. I mean, it takes episodes and episodes to be revealed what this guy August is even doing in Storybrooke, why he has Henry's book, why he adds new pages to Henry's book. It's a lot to handle at first. While August is a glorified background character in my opinion, he's one of the only good guys that seems to know what's really going on around here. We don't get many clues about what August's presence means for the show until episode 19 and 20. In episode 19, The Return, Gold spends the episode trying to figure out if August could be his long lost son. On Balefire from episode 8. But Gold eventually works out that the timeline is off and that Balefire would not be this young seeing as he disappeared almost 200 years ago. In the flashback of this episode, Rumpelstiltskin's son Balefire attempts to take him to another world, a world without magic, a world where they can be together without the weight of Rumpelstiltskin's evil power. Because Rumpelstiltskin is a coward, which the show loves to remind us about, he lets Balefire fall into the portal alone. This betrayal by Rumpel was also touched on in episode 12, Skin Deep, when he's having a conversation with Belle. Back in the present day, after realizing that August was playing him to get close to the dagger, Gold forces August to try and convince Emma of her past in order to break the curse. She trusts you. It might be enough. Try again. 
It's heavily implied here that Gold wants the curse to break so that he can leave Storybrooke to find the real Bale Fire. And we still don't know who this guy August is and how he knows that the fairy tales are real and why he didn't come over with the curse. It wouldn't be until the season's 20th episode where we find out that August's counterpart is, drumroll please, Pinocchio. Yeah. In the flashbacks, we see the blue fairy approach Geppetto and ask him to craft a magical wardrobe to send the savior to a land without magic. Geppetto basically forces Blue to lie to Snow and Charming about the fact that the wardrobe can only take one. It, in fact, can take two, and he insists that the other person will be Pinocchio due to the fact that, when under the curse, he would be turned back into wood. Pinocchio and Emma land in the world without magic and are found on the side of the road. In the present day, August tries to tell Emma that pursuing a custody battle with Regina would be a huge waste of time. Gold confronts August and tells him that he needs to get Emma to believe because this curse needs to break soon. Later that night, August takes Emma to a diner on the side of the road. August tells Emma that he was the seven-year-old boy who was found on the road with her. August then takes Emma to the tree that they came through in. He even tries to show her his wooden leg, which she cannot see because she doesn't believe. It's here where Emma basically decides that she's done trying to help people in this town. Needs you! I don't want them to need me! Well, that's too bad because we all do! You're saying that I am responsible for everyone's happiness? That is Crap! I didn't ask for that! I don't want it! Right now! A little while ago, you didn't want Henry either, but then he came to you, and now you are fighting like hell for him! For him! Because that is all I can handle right now, and I'm not even doing a good job at that! Now you're telling me I have to save everyone? That is beyond ridiculous! I don't want any of it! Then you're all screwed. She has like five people at this point telling her this crazy story that she's Snow White and Prince Charming's daughter. I would run too. Later, August has basically given up on Emma at this point, and he decides to ask Marco for a job so that he can spend his last moments as a human with his dad, even if his dad doesn't remember him. At the end of the episode, the most earth-shattering, world-collapsing thing happens. Emma decides that she's been in Storybrooke long enough and just needs to get Henry the hell out of there. I would argue that this makes so much sense from a character standpoint. Emma is nowhere near ready to settle down anywhere. At this point, she's only been in town for a little over four months. We even learn from a number of scenes in episode two that she does not like to stay in one place too long. This will obviously have very huge repercussions as she's decided to take Henry illegally. With Emma's character taking such a huge step backward in episode 20, The Stranger, viewers sat in suspense during the last two episodes, which essentially are about a last-ditch effort from Henry in getting Emma to believe. From the pilot, it was clear that this show was something special. I'm not sure if everyone knew how many seasons it would eventually have, but reading old reviews and headlines about the show really changed my perspective of how the show was perceived. Like, yeah, the CGI could be better, but the fact that the show had the task of following Lost, a show in which which the creators of Once Upon a Time worked on since its inception. Against all odds, Once Upon a Time's pilot was watched by nearly 13 million people live, which definitely wasn't as big as Lost. Apparently, Eddie and Adam had had the idea for Once Upon a Time in 2003 before they started Lost, but put it on the back burner until the show ended. Clearly, waiting was a good option because it gave them job security to be able to work on both shows. The pilot's first flashback sees Snow White being found by Charming in her glass coffin as she's under a curse. Episode 21 in Apple Red is Blood expands upon that part of the Snow White story. Days after Charming is found by George in episode 16, Heart of Darkness, George attempts to execute David when Regina shows up and offers a trade. After attempting to break into George's castle, Snow realizes that David isn't there and that Regina took him. Regina offers Snow a parlay, which if you aren't familiar with the term, basically means like two parties on opposite ends of like a war or a battle meeting together with no weapons and no funny business to talk terms. The two have a very powerful interaction at the site of where it all began, a site which now holds the grave of Regina's former lover, Daniel, the site of where they first met. Regina says the only way David will go free is if Snow White eats a poisoned apple and falls into a sleeping curse. It wouldn't work anyway. The choice is yours. It must be taken willingly. And why would I do that? You're charming. 
will be killed. Snow White then takes the apple willingly, realizing that she has no other option. And what have you done? Back in the present day, Emma returns to Storybrooke after regretting kidnapping Henry. Emma talks to Mary Margaret, who is more than upset. Hi, Margaret. But I couldn't tell for sure because you didn't bother to say goodbye. Do you remember when I left? When I ran, what you said to me, you said, we have to stick together. We're like family. Yeah. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have left. You're right, you shouldn't have. So why, after everything, did you just go? I don't want to be sheriff. I don't want people relying on me. I don't want this, any of it. What about Henry? I took him with me. You abducted him. So you don't want people to rely on you, but you took your son. Now that sounds like a stable home for him. What the hell is wrong with you? She decides that maybe she's the problem and that leaving Storybrooke might be the best option. Meanwhile, Regina asks Jefferson for some help. Together, they use a little magic that Regina has left in this world to reach into the past using the hat that Regina had been keeping from him for all these years. They use it to grab an object to, quote, deal with Emma. I'm not really sure how this aspect works because it's technically time travel. As far as I know, the hat cannot do that. Emma stops by Regina's house and tells her that she's leaving. Regina makes Emma take one of her famous apple turnovers. Emma then takes it for the road. This all comes down to the climax of the episode where Henry decides the only way to make Emma believe is to get her to wake him up from a sleeping curse because he knows that Regina poisoned that apple turnover. Trick to get you to eat that. What are you doing? I'm sorry it had to come into this. You may not believe in the curse or in me, but I believe in you. See? You wanna have some ice cream with that? And then we can go back to talking about... So Henry ends up eating the apple turnover and falling into a sleeping curse himself. And that's where this episode ends. Henry's decision is not without reason. Emma has basically refused to even consider hearing him in August out. Henry even goes to August in a scene during the episode. August has basically given up on Emma, as I said earlier. Emma seeing Henry faint and then the scene cutting to black signified the beginning of the end. Most viewers had probably assumed that after season one, that things were going to be shaken up quite a bit. Season two hadn't actually been fully announced until May 10th, 2012, just three days prior to season one's finale airing. The writers must have been pretty confident though, as they hadn't exactly provided an end to too many storylines here. I mean, you'll see that the finale is very, very good, but there isn't really a hint of finality to it. So they must have known to some extent that they'd be getting picked up. So the finale flashback opens with a continuation of the previous episode's flashback. Charming is rescued from Regina's castle by a mysterious black knight. This knight just so happens to be the Huntsman. Quick cameo aside, Charming is transported to the Forbidden Fortress by Regina, where he's surrounded by thousands and thousands of acres of trees. Rumpelstiltskin appears out of nowhere, and the two have a duel when Charming refuses his help. However, Rumpel bests him and gives him back his mother's wedding ring. The ring is now enchanted to help Charming finds Snow White. However, he tasks him with hiding a vial of magic in the belly of Maleficent first. After successfully completing the mission, Charming finally finds Snow White in the scene from the pilot. After the two finally reunite, we get the aftermath of this, where Charming proposes to Snow White, and they plan to take the kingdoms back from Regina and George. Meanwhile, in the present day, Emma arrives at the hospital with Henry. The doctors can't seem to find what's wrong with Henry. Emma even digs through Henry's stuff to see if he's eaten anything else besides the turnover. She grabs the Once Upon a Time book, and in the most cathartic moment of the series, everything suddenly hits Emma. It's all true. Regina arrives in distress. Henry obviously wasn't the target of the turnover. Emma and Regina get in this huge fight. Regina confirms the entire thing. It's true, isn't it? All of it. Yes. Together, they head to Mr. Gold. Gold tells them that he's had a bit of magic hidden pre-curse in the belly of Maleficent, which is a reference to the flashback of the episode where Charming does exactly that. Mm -hmm. Regina tells Emma what she's going to have to do. She's going to have to go under the Storybrooke clock tower and kill Maleficent 
in order to take the magic that's hidden within her. Meanwhile, Jefferson breaks into the mental ward to release Belle from her cell. Belle obviously was put there by Regina to keep gold from his true love. And in releasing Belle, this causes chaos as he's now betrayed Regina, just like Regina betrayed him. Emma faces Maleficent and uses her gun and then her father's sword to vanquish the beast and grabs the magic from within her. Soon after, she returns to the elevator and is tricked by Mr. Gold, who really wanted the magic for himself. Emma climbs up the elevator shaft by herself and finds that Regina has been tied up, so the two were swindled by gold yet again. They return to the hospital together and find out that Henry is unresponsive. This scene is so good. Emma and Regina's different reactions here are spot on. I think it makes sense for the curse to end here, though I'm sure back then it was a little bit of a shock. Like there's this sense of where do we go from here after this? Mr. Gold is found by Belle and the two have a very short but sweet reunion. He takes her to a well and dumps the vial of magic down it, which effectively brings magic to Storybrooke. Belle, whose memories are now back, questions Gold's motives as he's now here in a land without magic so he can go find his son, but Gold says he needs power as well to do so. We see a giant purple cloud of smoke erupt from the well and surround Storybrooke. Snow and Charming reunite and hold each other in the middle of the street as the camera fades to black. Ending season one with the curse breaking was a very bold choice on the writer's part. On one hand, it signals to the audience that the story is going in a bit of a different direction, which had fans across the world very excited because for the last 22 episodes, the formula had essentially stayed the same. With the same rules and stipulations, breaking the curse means that the possibilities are endless. Are they going to go back to the Enchanted Forest? Are they going to stay in Storybrooke? Will their cursed lives have any effect on their newly reunited families? I love the ending of season one due to how it sets up so much suspense for season two, and I think that's how a finale should function. You could argue that the writers wrote the curse breaking into the script because they weren't sure if they were going to get picked up, but I doubt that. On the other hand, it's a very ballsy move because the show now has the potential to get very, very crazy with its plot. I think a lot of people loved season one because it was very safe. You had two separate storylines in the past and in the present, and they didn't cross over very much. Storybrooke has no magic and therefore separates itself from the fairy tale land. The present day storylines are very focused on real life grounded scenarios. So what happens when you take all of that away and season two, and all of these people suddenly remember that they are fairy tale characters from stories their cursed selves remember from their childhoods. The show had all the potential to fail after season one, but I truly believe it tops itself in season two. The show takes so many turns and introduces us to new and fresh ideas in that season. Many overlook it because it doesn't feel quite as big as the seasons that followed, but I'll do my best to convince y'all when I get to that video. The audience had at least a little bit of a clue of the direction the show was going, and it comes in the form of the last scene, where Gold brings magic to Storybrooke. We know we'll be dealing with our old slash new foes, Regina and Mr. Gold, but something tells me there's a little bit more in store for our heroes. This season, you know, I think is the next chapter. Last season we broke the curse and everyone remembers who they are, but they have not found themselves back in the enchanted forest. So I wonder why. The curse is broken. Why didn't they go back? Is there even an enchanted forest to go back to? So what do we do now? And you know, what happens now where they realize what they are and what they've lost?